and welcome to Women's Health. My name is Kathy Ermacher. I currently serve as the chair of the Mayor's Commission on Women. On behalf of the commission and also the Women's Foundation, which is providing our funding for today, welcome to this issue of Women's Health, a series of programs about issues that affect women related to their health. Today, our topic is about infertility, and I'm joined today by Dr. Katie Fawson, who is here to, doc, to talk to us about infertility. So thank you for joining us. Sure, we appreciate your taking the time to be with us Absolutely. today. Absolutely, I'm pleased to be here. Let's start out with the medical definition of infertility. I think sure. that probably means something different to everyone when they right. hear it, but let's really start with sort of a basic definition. Right, right. It's kind of interesting because different places that you look, you'll, you'll find different definitions, theoretically, of what infertility actually is, couple to couple. Um, in the clinical world, you know, being medical professionals, obstetric, obstetrician, gynecologists, we tend to consider infertility after a year um, of unprotected intercourse and an inability to achieve a pregnancy, regardless of how that pregnancy comes out. So even if you establish a pregnancy and you have a miscarriage, you're still not considered to be infertile because you have indeed achieved a pregnancy. I see. So um, infertility itself is technically, you know, at least the way we look at it, a year of unprotected intercourse without the ability to, to achieve pregnancy. If you look at the World Health Organization's definition, they consider two years of unprotected intercourse to be to be infertility. That's so, interesting. What would yeah. be why would that be different? You know, I think it's just a, it's, you know, just kind of a difference in the clinical um, nature is certainly location to location. You're going to see a lot of variance in the way people practice country to country. And the World Health Organization obviously is kind of considering, you know, the world's medicine as opposed to the United States. Um, Whereas I can say clinically here in our country, we tend to start evaluation and, and you know, more treatment typically at a year. And getting, and it, getting it started faster. Exactly. So and theirs is more of a conservative Exactly. Definition, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Now, um, in looking at infertility, sure. there's primary infertility and secondary infertility. There what is. does primary mean? So, primary infertility means that a couple who have been together for at least a year, unprotected intercourse, have never been able to establish a pregnancy. Um, meaning that they have never had a pregnancy that either carried to miscarriage or a live birth, okay? Secondary um, is where a couple has had a child previously and now for some reason they're having issues with becoming pregnant. So regardless of if they had problems in the first pregnancy or not, they're now secondarily infertile. So primary infertility is um, what we're gonna see with a new couple that comes to us and says, you know, we've been having unprotected intercourse for over a year um, and we still have not achieved a pregnancy. Whereas those individuals that come to us and they say, you know, I had my first baby, I didn't really have many issues at all, I got pregnant pretty quickly and now it's been over a year and I just can't get pregnant. That's gonna be a secondary infertility couple. Is it more common, the primary or the secondary? You know, primary tends to be what we see more often, to be honest with you. Secondary tends to come um, with something that has happened either health-wise with either the male or the female. Um, so primary infertility tends to be what people seek treatment for more commonly. Um, because typically, if you've achieved one pregnancy, we certainly would expect, you know, as long as you're in the same relationship, that you could actually achieve another pregnancy, depending on the factors. It's important to remember, too, that if a, a woman does change relationships, for example, she has now a new partner. So she's had, um, for example, a child with her first husband, went through a divorce, now she's in a new relationship, um, and they've been trying for over a year and have been unsuccessful. She's now a primary infertility case because she was able to be successful with her first partner, but now it's been a year within that couple um, and she's not been successful. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. And there's so many facets to it, I think. It's oh, really- tons, yeah, tons. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. just, it's not a simple, right. a simple question. Right. Um, what are the more, more common reasons for infertility? It seems sure. to me that when I think about this, I hear a lot more talk about that now than, mm -hmm. than perhaps we did 20, 25 years ago. I'm wondering, is it more common now? Is it just something that we know more about? And then sure. what are some of the causes for infertility? Sure, it's kind of interesting. If you actually look at the numbers, Kathy, the numbers of infertility cases have not necessarily increased. There's possibly been a small increase over the last 30 years, but there have been a few things kind of culturally in the United States and whatnot that have taken place that certainly make it e look like there has been an inflation in the amount of infertility. Um, the first would be just 
more research. We know more about infertility now. We know how to treat it. We have wonderful um, options of what are called assisted reproductive technology. So these include things like in vitro fertilization, intrauterine insemination, things that we've learned a lot about and are now available that weren't available previously. So those individuals that maybe wouldn't have sought treatment and whatnot because these things didn't exist are now seeking treatment and coming out as infertile couples. Um, the second thing that we're seeing is kind of changes in our, our landscape, you know, just demographically, um, occupationally, women are tending to um, advance their occupations, they're getting higher education, they're focusing a little bit more on careers and those things, which is a wonderful thing, but that's causing them to put off childbearing, possibly to a time in their life when they may not be as fertile, because as we age, unfortunately, our, our egg quality goes down, things can become a little bit more difficult. So we certainly see more women with issues now, simply because we're trying to have children later. Um, Another thing that kind of inflated it over these last 30 years would be the baby boomers. There were so many children born, there were so many women that were born that then reached reproductive age, um, and possibly some of them had infertility issues, so that kind of made the numbers go up as well. Sure. Um, culturally, and certainly in our country, now kind of going back to the first concept, the assisted reproductive technology, that is so much more common, that is so much more socially acceptable. You know, it's something now that, that couples are able to come out and they're able to say, you know, we've been having this issue because we know now that there are treatments available to us and we can, we can seek help and we can be successful in having children. So there's certainly a perceived increase um, in all of these things because now the media, you know, will see movie sure. stars and things like that that are having babies at age 45, you know, mm -hmm. because there's, we just didn't have that technology available. So it's certainly now even more socially acceptable. Um, but it is, like you say, a very wide-ranging topic and kind of the causes. If you think of all the things that go into fertility, you have to have, from the male, you have to have sperm that functions well, is able to move throughout you know, various environments within the female body. Um, you need to have a cervix that will allow the sperm to move through, will nourish the sperm, not be caustic to the sperm or toxic to the sperm with its own secretions. You have to have um, a tube that's capable of, you know, kind of moving um, not only the sperm, but also the egg to unite in the tube. And then finally, you have to have a uterus that's functioning well, where an embryo can implant and um, everything can take place and a baby can grow well. So there are several different factors. And if we consider women alone, in about 40% of cases, we're gonna see, 40% of primary infertility, we're going to see an issue with ovulation, that being forming and releasing the egg. Okay, so that tends to be something that we'll see a lot in a general obstetrics and gynecology practice where we end up having to treat women to help them in some way either to ovulate well or to ovulate, period. So we don't always ovulate. Another 40% of cases, we're gonna see what's called pelvic or tubal pathology. So pelvic pathology would be issues like endometriosis, um, scar tissue in the pelvis that's for some reason caused issues with the tubes, caused the tubes not to function well because as we mentioned earlier, we need those tubes to be able to kind of peristalse and move everything along. Um, so if the tubes aren't functioning well, that's certainly an issue. In about 10% of cases, we're not gonna know what's going on. We're gonna have fertility that's undiagnosed. We've done all the testing, we've looked into everything, and things just aren't going the way that we would expect them to go. Um, and then in about 5% of cases or 10% of cases, you're gonna have those rare issues. For example, like a uterus that didn't develop normally or something of that nature where you just unfortunately can't support a pregnancy. Mm. Um, if we bring men into the equation though, and we look at at couples because we tend to think of infertility and men will say, well, my semen analysis is normal, I'm off the hook, you know, which may or may not be the case. Um, but in about, with you consider a couple that's primarily infertile, about 35% of the time, it's gonna be what's called a male factor or something from the man that is actually contributing. So hmm. we have to give men their, their just desserts in this deal as well, so. There is some issues related to the men as exactly, well. Exactly, exactly, but certainly because women are responsible for establishing, maintaining, and carrying the pregnancy, we have a lot more treatment options for females and the, the workup tends to be a lot more invasive and can be a longer process for the right. female aspects. Sure. 
Now, as far as treatment goes, then, what are some of the most um, widely accepted or the most common treatments? So you've alluded to a few of them, but sure. what, let's kind of go through some of the treatment options. Sure. So if we have a woman coming in um, or a couple comes into us and they say, we've been trying for over a year and we have not achieved pregnancy, sometimes it's just an education situation about the timing of intercourse when you're likely to be the most successful. So we have women sometimes come and we educate them about ovulation predictor kits, which are something that you can just buy over the counter mm -hmm. at Osco, Super Saver, you know, um, those sorts of places. Um, next to the pregnancy test, pee on the stick and it will tell you when it looks like you're ovulating. Um, and then we recommend that you would have intercourse that night and the next night. Um, and that should be theoretically the time that you would be most likely to be fertile. Um, if, you know, women come in and, and they've tried all of those things, we'll start to do some laboratory testing and see what their ovarian function looks like, see what their hormone levels are doing. And often we'll find, like we mentioned, that they're not ovulating. For some reason, we're not getting good um, formation of an egg. Um, and the egg is responsible for not only being obviously half of the pregnancy that's going to develop, um, but air also the area that's left behind in the ovary once the egg is released is responsible for producing progesterone, which is gonna be the hormone that's gonna support the pregnancy and those sorts of things. So if we can't ovulate well, there are several factors that are gonna keep us from getting pregnant. So medications that we can use um, for helping a woman to ovulate, the most common that women are often, often um, kind of familiar with is Clomid, mm -hmm. and that's one that's that- That's one that a yeah, lot of people know that name. Right, general obstetrician gynecologists offer often in our office, we do a lot of Clomid treatment. Um, and then again, we go back to the timed intercourse with Clomid and, and hopefully that helps women. Um, other things that we can offer if, again, those things are not fruitful, <laughs> in an interesting word to mm -hmm. use, right? Um, we can do what's called intrauterine insemination, where we get um, a sperm sample from the male. In our office particularly, we then spin it down and we're able to kind of wash it, cleanse it, look at it under the microscope, make sure that the quality is okay, and then inject it right into the uterus um, of the female once we've done an ultrasound and things look like she's ovulating well and we know that the timing is good. Um, so those are some options that general obstetrician gynecologists can offer to patients. Um, and there's various steps along the way of kind of assessing things and making sure that everything else looks okay. And, if in the general obstetrics and gynecology world we aren't able to help, there's now a whole new kind of offshoot um, specialty called reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And those are the individuals that are gonna do the more invasive treatment in getting women pregnant. So that would be like your injectable hormones, um, in vitro fertilization, where actually um, a woman is given injectable medications to cause her to super ovulate or to produce many eggs. Those are then harvested actually through the vagina in a special process. And then they're put together with sperm outside of the body to form embryos. And then those embryos are replaced into the woman. Um, and this is you know, a last resort in many cases because it's, it's a fairly costly procedure. Um, so that is an option. If we find that there's issues with a woman or a man for some reason that are not working well, for example, if the sperm, for example, some men don't produce sperm, they've got um, some sort of a genetic issue and they just don't produce sperm like we would like them to, there's options for donor sperm, um, there's options now for donor eggs. Um, women that are willing to be donors can go through that same kind of what's called hyper ovulation process and have their eggs harvested and then give those to couples that are infertile. Um, also an option. So wow. there's a lot out there now. There is a lot mm -hmm. of options. And so I think that's what you were alluding to is that there's right. so many different options now and exactly. lots of different kinds of treatments. You mentioned something about the cost of, of the treatments. Right. And um, right. I think particularly these days when we're talking about insurance and the whole you know field of medical costs it's and an things issue. like that. Yeah. Well, would you talk just a little bit about the costs involved in some of these sure. things, and mm -hmm. then also if is if they're prohibitive, if the insurances are covering these types of things, or perhaps some of them, not all. Sure, sure. A lot of what we will see in our practice, what we um, experience, is that insurance companies often are not comfortable paying for infertility, either for treatments or anything of that nature. So. If you're doing, for example, a workup on a couple to diagnose infertility, everything until you are able to actually diagnose it and say, this is the reason for your infertility is often covered. However, then once that diagnosis is made and a couple or a woman is labeled infertile, often any further treatments or further um, workup that she would undergo would no longer be covered. 
Really? So, yeah, so that's something that we'll see a lot because insurance companies tend to not look at infertility as a medical condition, which is very difficult, you know, and it's it's diff it's frustrating for us as well because a lot of our patients do have medical indications as to why they aren't ovulating, you know, for example, polycystic ovarian syndrome, issues like that. Um, but then, yes, insurance companies, it tends to be a very difficult thing. Um, the less invasive we have to be, obviously, the less expensive the treatments are going to be. So, for example, when we talked about the Clomid, if you can get successful, you know, cycles with one dose of Clomid, um, or excuse me, one course of Clomid, it may be a $50 cost to you to, to buy that Clomid for five days and then achieve a pregnancy. If you do timed intercourse and you're able to be successful, um, that's all the way up to in vitro fertilization done by a reproductive endocrinologist, which when you think about the cost for all the injectable medications, which are often needed on a daily basis, um, then the actual surgical procedure to harvest the eggs, putting the eggs together, looking at the quality of the embryos, looking at the sperm, um, all of those things, and then reimplanting, then you're talking kind of in the multiple thousands dollar range. So sometimes 18 to $20,000 for a couple when all is said and done after one cycle of IVF. So, so that is prohibitive? It can be prohibitive for many. Mm -hmm. And especially if they're not being able to be covered by insurance. Right, right. right. It, becomes right. A, it becomes a pay out of pocket situation. And a lot of reproductive endocrinology and infertility clinics will offer you know, payment plans. So it's almost like when you've purchased a car, except you're purchasing you know, mm -hmm. your, your pregnancy. And, and for a lot, of, a lot of patients that have been struggling for a long time, it becomes worth it, you know, mm -hmm. to think about it as, as um, an investment in their future and their ability to have children. And right. So, but then on the other hand, we would have to question, you know, it seems so unfair in some ways. Absolutely. If it is a medical condition and it is something that's super important to a person, right. to a, a couple, to not be able to afford it. Right. That also it's, seems it's very, cruel. Yeah. yeah, it seems very unfortunate, it does seem, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It really know? does, it really do does. Do you see any change coming for that kind of thing or you are know, we stuck? It's difficult to say um, with all the changes that we may see in healthcare. It's it's very difficult to say. Um, I, I would suggest that the, the coverage could get worse or better depending on kind of the, the medical climate that we're gonna see. And I think with um, the current changes that are happening in healthcare, none of us knows exactly what's gonna occur with, with really any sort of situations. But um, as insurance changes, um, you know, we're certainly seeing differences in coverage of birth control methods and those sorts of things. So that certainly begs the question, is fertility going to be one of those issues that would be next on the list that mm -hmm. people would say, you know, this is something important that we feel it's important that we have coverage mm -hmm. for. Because when you think about it, fertility itself, you know, by the definition that we discussed earlier, affects, you know, 10 to 15 percent of couples. So it's not something that's necessarily a small amount of people that we're talking about. 10 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. So that's quite a bit. Well, is. let's talk just a little bit about some of the, the psychological and emotional consequences of sure. this. And, and I'm sure that you see a great deal of that. What are, you, what are you seeing with that? Absolutely. It just becomes very difficult and very taxing on the couple. You know, um, for example, we'll have uh, we'll have a man and a woman come in for their very first um, their first consultation, for example, with me or with one of my partners, and they will have been going through this already for a year or two years, and sometimes three, four, five, six years trying to achieve a pregnancy. So already, that's mentally taxing. It's difficult for them. They don't understand why they're not being blessed with a child, you know? And in some cases, it's extra frustrating for them if we've talked about like secondary infertility where they say, I've been able to do this in the past, why can I not do this now? Um, something that we're seeing too is that women are coming in at a, a bit of an older age and they're saying, I, I would like to be pregnant, you know, they're in their early 40s, uh, up to possibly 45 years of age, those sorts of things, and they're saying, well, now is kind of when I picked in my life that I wanted to be pregnant and it becomes, it becomes more difficult, but at the same time, that's something that they feel that they should be able to do. And that's certainly you know, reasonable with the technology that we have today. Um, but I think it's just very difficult when you come up against the possibility that you can't have children because having children is, is such a wonderful thing. So mm -hmm. it's just very mentally taxing. And we talked about too, the male um, kind of factor in fertility and, and the man kind of being able to say, well, my sperm analysis is normal, so theoretically I'm not the problem. Well, the, the man still ends up dealing with a lot of difficulty and it's, it's, very men, it's very taxing on the men as well. I mean, they go through psychological and emotional hardship 
right along with the women. So I think it's very difficult um, for couples and just emotionally especially. Um, physically, we'll see it take a toll on women depending on what kind of treatment we're having to do. Um, if she's receiving hormones every cycle, especially if she's receiving injectable hormones, I mean, these can have significant side effects as far as kind of emotional ability, not feeling well. Um, there are medical complications that can, that can accompany those drugs. Nothing is without its side effects. And so, although um, a woman suffers kind of the physical and psychological aspects of infertility, a lot of women, you know, they'll say it's worth it, you know, if they can get through to the end and, and get a child. But it can be a very difficult and, and taxing process, understandably. Mm -hmm. So, And then in that case, are there, um, like counseling types of things that can help? Or sure, whatever. sure. There are counselors available, you know, and certainly um, talking with patients and, and just having them be able to talk out their frustrations and be able to say, you know, this, I don't understand why this isn't happening for me. It's happening for my friends. It's happening for my sister. It happened for my cousin, you know, and so it becomes very difficult, especially when you're trying to achieve pregnancy. It seems like everybody becomes pregnant around you, you know, which is, sure. which is right. a difficult thing. And um, you're certainly hypersensitive to seeing pregnant women, whereas if you weren't trying to become pregnant, maybe it wouldn't be as big of an issue. Um, but you certainly do notice it a lot, you know, when you're when you're struggling. I hmm. think that's true. That's interesting. So, yeah. It's 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 also interesting to me that in our culture we we have kind of reached this sort of place where you've got women who are holding off on having children mm -hmm. because of the cultural component of you can have it all, let's right. do the education, let's do the career, let's right. do all that. And then we also have this sort of waiting too long type of complication, mm -hmm. and then it's not the cultural and the biological are not necessarily not coming together up. at the right. same time. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned the baby boomers. boomers. I hadn't thought about that, but you have mm -hmm. this huge glut then of people that are, are right. in this circumstance. Sure. And I think perhaps the baby boomers also were the ones given that message culturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hold off a little bit, wait, get a career, right. women can do it all and, and that kind of thing. Do you think culturally that's changing somewhat? Are you seeing more women coming that are younger trying to have children or are, are we still kind of in that let's wait and let's go to old, that type of thing? Sure, I would say that we see kind of, we really do kind of run the gamut, Kathy, as far as the ages of women that are coming in with primary infertility cases because we'll still have those individuals that for some reason in their early 20s, you know, they're trying to achieve a pregnancy and they're not able to um, be that for um, something that has affected their tubes. Maybe they had a sexually transmitted disease when they were younger, got pelvic inflammatory disease, and now they're having issues getting pregnant. Um, all the way up to exactly the individual that you're mentioning who's now 40 and says, this is kind of when I planned that I wanted to have my, my children, um, but sometimes comes into that with slightly unrealistic expectations in that, as you mentioned, the culture and the biology just don't line up. And so there become a lot of extra steps, a lot of extra workup, and sometimes very invasive um, options for that, for that patient. Um, but I would say just kind of as a whole, because of the issues that we mentioned earlier, you know, we are seeing a lot of patients kind of in their later 30s, early 40s, um, certainly looking to start their families or add to their families, and, and it's an issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it would seem also that the media has kind of fed into that somewhat. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Uh, particularly in, in our culture, you know, we're talking about the differences between our country and other countries. Mm -hmm. Probably the whole media issue is somewhat of an issue, you know, for Absolutely us true. as well, because we have kind of hypermedia sometimes right, right. when it comes to these kinds of issues. Right. And we and I think some of that too, you know, it's a lot of what happens with the stars and those sorts of things is very behind the scenes. So we don't know exactly what they went through. Um, but that does foster those things in our culture that says, you know, she's done it, I should be able to do it as well. Well you don't know exactly what it took for her to do that or, or right, those sorts exactly. of things. What kind of technology was used? Did somebody donate eggs? You know, mm -hmm. um, those are the other questions. So uh -huh. it's difficult because cultural perceptions make make women hard on themselves. You know, we know that from, from various aspects of our culture. And so I think especially in fertility, it's very important for women to kind of take a step back and not blame themselves and understand that, you know, this is a situation that happens to a lot of women and sometimes the stress of the situation can unfortunately make it worse. I was gonna say, so, don't you think that it probably is that the, the stress of the situation and the absolutely. whole emotional factor makes the physical even more difficult. Exactly, we see that often where a couple has had to go through 
um, several years of workup and then maybe even IVF in order to achieve their first pregnancy. So for that reason, then they don't use any birth control and then here they are with a 12 month old and another baby on the way because the stress is off and they didn't think they needed birth control and they got pregnant. Mm -hmm. So so it really is a multi-pronged, you know, sort of multifaceted absolutely. issue because you're looking at not just the physical, which is obviously all in itself fairly complicated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you're also looking at the emotional factors that can influence the the exactly. physical and, and the psychological is, right. is all part of that. Our hormones are very, very mixed up in our minds. So it's right. true. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think as you mentioned, the cultural um, whether you have a child or not also factors into that. I mean, right. seriously, obviously, some families feel very strongly and some Extremely. parts of our culture mm -hmm. and some, some various groups feel very strongly about having children. Right. And then on the other hand, there are some that are more accepting of not having children and, right. and childless couples. And probably we all see that in a different way. Exactly. As an individual. It all just kind of depends, yeah. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So any l new trends, anything new coming down the thing that we should be watching for or listening for? Anything in the treatment of infertility or uh, anything that's exciting? You know, I think as things continue, there's research going on all the time. Um, there's a lot going on with male factor infertility at this point. Um, we are a little bit still kind of relatively unknowledgeable as far as what actually causes sperm to be good or not good sperm sometimes. Um, so there's new things that are coming down the pipe and things that have been used for the last few years. Um, for example, like intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is where we can actually get a sperm sample from a male who say, say has very bad motility of the sperm. Um, and the sperm can actually be injected directly into the egg. So the sperm doesn't actually have to go anywhere and it's at its, its location and it's able to achieve a pregnancy. So I think that's definitely an area where research is, is blossoming and, and female factor infertility is always something that people are looking at and it's a very active research subject. So very I interesting. Think we'll continue to see changes. Technology will assist in this particular area Absolutely. as well as everything else. Yeah, That's absolutely. Great. Uh -huh. Well, Dr. Fawson, thank you so much for being with thank us today. You, Kathy. We really appreciate this. This great. is such an important topic and it's absolutely. also very interesting. And I think that it's a good thing for people to know what some of the options are and what the treatments options sure. are and all that kind of thing. So thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Today. It was my pleasure. Yeah. This is Women's Health, a series of programs about women's health issues. We really want to thank the Women's Foundation for providing funding for our program today on infertility. If you would like to know more about women's issues and if you would like to find out more about the Women's Foundation, please join our website at lincolnwomen.org. If you have concerns or comments or if you would like to maybe suggest an idea for a program for women's health, please feel free to also contact us via our email which is lincolnwomen at gmail.com. Again, my name is Kathy Ermacher. I'm chair of the Marist Commission on Women, and we thank you for joining us today on Women's Health.